So uh, let me start with a historic example of, uh, of discrete optimization. So we'll go to, go to non-convex uh, continuous um, polynomial optimization uh, in a bit, but somehow the, the, the discrete um, uh, uh, part will, will, will give us some of the motivation for the kinds of theorems that we want to uh, that you want to um, prove. So, so this uh, uh, figure that you see there is from a, a secret report uh, of Harris and Ross from 1955. I don't know who, who has seen this figure before? Just it's sometimes it's quite popular. Ted Harris, is it? Say, say again? This is Ted Harris. I'm not sure what's this person, but, but yeah, I think uh, T. Harris. Yeah, I don't know whether that Ted Harris is another Harris. I see. So, so, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. Ted Harris is the one with the interpolation and all of those. I see. So, so, okay, maybe he's someone else. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> And uh, so, so Ross was a retired army general at the time. And um, uh, so, um, so this map shows, uh, shows the railroad ne network between Eastern Europe and the uh, Soviet Union at the time. And uh, what, uh, what they were interested in um, was um, uh, in uh, interdicting this, this uh, rail uh, railway system. And, 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 and what, what, what they thought of doing uh, is uh, the way they do, did, 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 what, what they did was they, they found some bottleneck between um, uh, Eastern Europe and uh, and the uh, western part of the Soviet Union, and they, they thought that you know if 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 um, if, they, if we could in some way uh, if, if they could in some way interdict those railway connections, it would disrupt the the supply that went between um, uh, Eastern Europe and uh, and um, uh, and the western part of Soviet of the, of the Soviet Union. And so you know, so um, so here, what you know, what they identified was was a minimal um, subset of these uh, railway connections, so that if you separate them, you you disconnect the the Eastern Europe part and the Western Soviet Union part. Okay, and today today we uh, uh, we, we know this uh, problem uh, under the name of uh, the minimum ST cut problem, and in this problem um, we are given an undirected graph G, and uh, two vertices S and T. And the goal is to remove as few edges as possible from the graph so that no um, path between S and T remains. So maybe let me uh, draw a picture here. So we have, uh, we have this graph, two vertices, uh, designated vertices S and T. And then uh, there are some other vertices and some edges. And what we want to find is, is, a way to, uh, is a subset of the edges to remove so that we uh, uh, so, so, so that no path from S to T remains. And uh, so this would actually not be a, a, a minimum cut, um, because we remove three edges, so we would have to remove, uh, maybe this, this would be a better choice. And uh, so, so equivalently, what we want to do is we want to find a bipartition of the vertex set into two sets uh, that separate uh, S and T in such a way that as few edges of the graph uh, as possible are cut. OK, and this problem has many applications. Uh, most of them are much more peaceful than the kind of applications that Harris and Ross had in mind. Um, and uh, another important uh, uh, aspect of this problem is that uh, it has a, um, uh, a polynomial time algorithm. Actually, around the same time, and I think motivated by the report of Harris and Ross, Ford and Falkerson found a polynomial time algorithm um, for this problem. And completely, what this means is that uh, the number of elementary steps that the algorithm performs uh, for a given input is at most uh, quadratic in the, in the size of the input, which in this case would be the number of vertices plus the number of edges. So that would be how, how we measure the, the size of the input. Um, and, uh, and you know, like, like algorithms for um, shortest paths or... That's to find the best one. Say again? That's to find the actual minimum. Ah, the minimum cut, yes, the minimum cut. Right. Ah, uh, right. As, as few, right, as few as, exactly. So here we want to rerun the uh, remove as few edges as possible. Right? And here we can, can do it exactly without any approximation, exactly. Um, <coughs> you know, and, and so this is one of the kind of, uh, one of the very classical um, optimization, um, graph optimization algor algorithms or problems that, that, that we take to see as undergraduates, you know, like uh, shortest paths and um, um, finding minimum uh, spanning trees. And among, but among those algorithms, this, this would be actually considered the you know, most advanced algor algorithm that uh, every um, uh, um, uh, CS undergraduate student uh, learns about. Okay. So I will not uh, tell you the algorithm. The algorithm is very simple, but uh, um, that, that sort of will not be the point of this talk. Um, <coughs> and um, so now let me ask uh, what, what happens if instead of finding a minimum cut, we want to find a maximum cut. 
So the same setup, we have a graph. And now we want to find a bipartition of the vertices that cuts as many edges as possible. OK, so I could have kept these vertices S and T that if you wanted to separate, uh, I could, could have kept them in there in the definition. But somehow, that it, will, it wouldn't change much in the discussion. It's just that the classical definition of this problem is without S and T for max cut. Uh, and um, you know, we might expect that, so, so we made this very um, you know, sort of minor change into, in, 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 the, in the formulation of the problem. We might expect that we could um, you know, take our algorithm that computes a minimum cut in, in a graph and just make simple changes, maybe flip some signs, uh, and, and in this way, get an algorithm that finds the maximum cut in a graph. The by cut, do you mean in some sense there should be a continuous cut? Ah, um, okay. So, so right, what, what, what? I cut every graph, I cut every edge. Yeah, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so here, right, I, I want to find the vertex by partition. <coughs> ah, okay. And then uh, that induces um, okay. some, some set of edges that are cut. Yes, yes, yes. But you don't ask that the two sets of vertices themselves be connected by edges. No, no. That, that doesn't have to be the case, yeah. Uh -huh. so, so, in particular, right, and maybe do, we do an example. So if you have a graph, um, um, if you have a graph like that, um, uh, let's maybe make it a little less trivial. Then the maximum cut would be uh, this this vertex by, by partition. Okay, so it cut, actually cuts all the edges in this case. So that's as bad, best as we can do, um, as good as we can do. So this would be an optimal cut in this graph. Right, so, so, so we could hope that we, you know, just simple modif you know, maybe a simple modification of the problem statement, maybe, you know, an equally simple modification to the algorithm will give us an algorithm for max cut. Unfortunately, uh, you know, this turns out to be not the case, and in a very strong sense. In particular, um, you know, finding a maximum cut in a graph is NP hard. So it was among, you know, the first problems that were proven to be NP hard by CARP in 72. So this means that, um, you know, unless, assuming this conjecture that P is different from NP, there's no polynomial time algorithm um, to you solve. Can you recognize that you have the best. Yes. Yeah, if, if uh, no, no. Um, so if if you can cut all edges, then uh, then, you th then you can recognize it. <laughs> <laughs> but but. So NP hard means it's even harder. Uh, uh, I I mean by recognizing the best one. Okay. So so, yeah, so these are all these are. Right. Right. The yes. Yes. So these are optimization problems. So here uh, NP means that, you know, um, that you can. Certify that you have um, basically you, you can compute how many edges a, a bipartition cuts. So you can you can sort of see how good a, a, a given bipartition is. That's easy. That's easy. But but you actually uh, but actually convincing yourself. So if I give you the optimal cut and convincing yourself that this is really an optimal cut, this is uh, also uh, you know hard. Yeah. Even, even if I would give it to you. Okay. So this is uh, some. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um. <coughs> right. Okay. So 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 so, so, so there's sort of this, this stark difference between these two problems, even though syntactically they were similar. And um, <coughs> you know, it turns out that the best um, polynomial time algorithm, the, the, the polynomial time algorithm with best known guarantees for for max cut, uh, is, an, is, an, is an algorithm due to Germans and Williamson. And uh, the algorithm has the property that for any given graph, in polynomial time, it can find a bipartition of the vertices that cuts at least uh, 0.878 times as many edges as the best possible bipartition. Can we say that this algorithm achieves an approximation ratio of 0.878, uh, or that it's an, a 0.878 approximation algorithm? Okay. And this number, 0.878, is, uh, you know, so, so, so this is, of course, just a numerical approximation to some, um, to some number that actually arises from isoparametric inequality. But uh, I, I, I will not, again, this will not be the topic of the talk, unfortunately. Yes, yes. yes, yes, yeah, very good question. Yes, uh, exactly. So, so there is a number, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's larger than this, okay? <laughs> uh, it's, 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 yeah, it's, 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 it's bound away from this number such that we know uh, it's, uh, it's NP hard to achieve that kind of approximation. And actually, like that is um, sort of one of the key open questions in this area. So, there's this gap between what we know can be done in polynomial time and what we know is NP hard. And closing this gap, um, and there are some uh, sort of approaches towards closing this gap, is an extremely interesting open problem. Uh, so you know that 0.999 is. Yeah, 0.99 is, is NP hard, exactly. <laughs> you know that's NP hard, and you're yes. not going to get yeah, it. Yeah, I think uh, if, if, if I rem uh, <laughs> see, uh, I think the number uh, is uh, the current best number is 16 over 17. 
So this is. Uh, and, and, and you know, if it's if it's bigger than that, you can't get exactly. You can't get a polymer. Exactly. But but you, you know, as you might guess, this number sixteen or seventeen, it's it's not that yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. And do we know the polynomial? Second. Do we know the polynomial? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a good question. So the, the, the polynomial in the running time, uh, you mean? Yeah, so, so uh, here you can do it in nearly linear time. So this would actually be a practical algorithm. Yeah. So it's interesting that you, you can do it in quadratic or you know, higher and higher time. It still doesn't yes, do yes. It. You still hit the same barrel. No, no, yeah, yes, exactly. And th so those, th th those it's similar to like an expander, since a lot of us don't even know about expanders. <laughs> uh, you can you approximate the expander from the eigenvalue, yes. which gives you an approximation. Yes. 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 Exactly. And this, this is actually actually it's closely related. Um, so this there's some connection of this of this algorithm to uh, eigenvalues. The connection is, is a little, little bit subtle, but um, but it, it exists. Yeah. Um, right. And actually, this this question, you know, like here, in some sense. Um, um, you know, if, if this would be the, the, the correct uh, threshold for NP hardness, suppose we could prove a better NP hardness and show that actually not just this number is NP hard, but better than any, any, any number better than this is NP hard. Then, you know, what, 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 what you remarked is that actually it would show that there is some kind of uh, threshold phenomenon. That, you know, something you can do in, 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 in linear time, actually, or in close to linear time. And then uh, once you want to go beyond that, it will become ex uh, NP hard, which actually means that uh, not just super, super polynomial time is required, but, you know, close to exponential time is required, as, as, you know, assuming the kinds of things that we believe about uh, NP hard problems. Now, if I restrict myself to a, a nice set of graphs, then, then, then probably you okay. can do it very easily. Yes, yes, yes. That's, 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 that's a good, very good point. So like these planar graphs or something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. So th these are very much about worst case, worst, worst case problems, and but, but we will we will get to sort of this issue about worst case versus uh, other other interesting cases. When you speak of linear uh, graphs of the problem, does it depend on how you present the graph? Just a list of uh, of uh, edges is enough, or do you have to be able to tell what are the next or the vertices? Right, right. Um, so, so here, so, so actually, so if you give me a list of edges, it will be fine. You can you can uh, sort of efficiently rearrange the list in a way that you, you can pre -process, you can process it, it in a good way. Yeah. Um, good. Okay, and, and what is uh, uh, sort of actually the the, the part of is this picture that uh, is most disconcerting to me is so we saw that you know this syntactic change made a huge difference in the complexity, but what is what what I like like sort of less about this is that. Um, if you look at this, this this algorithm, it seems to be completely unrelated to this algorithm, okay? And and this is uh, you know uh, something that that, uh, that is not so nice because somehow it means that you know not only does the, does the computational property of our problem change, but also you know we, we we have to completely rethink the algorithm from scratch whenever we make a small modification to the problem. And the question I'm interested in is um, you know um, is this inherent, um, or, you know, or um, you know, and, and there are many, many interesting examples, many, many similar examples where exactly this happens, that s s small changes in the problem require you to use very different kinds of algorithms. And I want to, I, I'm interested in the question whether this is inherent. You know, is it really the case that whenever we make a small change in our problem, we have to completely rethink the algorithm? Or could there be uh, some kind of general principles that help us identify uh, what's the best possible polynomial time algorithm for a problem? Okay. And, um, you know, one important question is, you know, how could uh, such a principle look like? Okay, and um, and as a way to capture these kinds of principles, we could try to use meta algorithms. So meta algorithms are uh, algorithms that are not tailored toward a particular problem, but but instead apply to a wide range of problems. And uh, you know, there are many examples of meta algorithms. For example, gradient descent, belief propagation, expectation maximization, set solvers. Maybe you, you've heard of uh, some of those. These are all examples of, of meta algorithms, and they, they actually those those that are used in practice. So they work uh, uh, extremely well. At, at the heart, they're all based on some kind of local search. Unfortunately, for these kind of meta algorithms, um, we, we can't prove uh, uh, good. Uh, uh, you know, the kind of guarantees you can prove are very weak, both compared to um, you know how well they do in, in practice and uh, compared to the best um, you know problem specific algorithms that we know for these problems. For example, belief propagation, is, is that useful for this at all or not? 
Right. We, we, no, no, we, 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 so, so, so for real propagation, um, we don't know how to prove any of these kinds of bounds that I showed on the, on the previous slide. And, uh, and I think uh, it, you know, because these are worst case problems, I, I don't believe, uh, I actually would, would, I would be pretty sure that belief propagation doesn't achieve those bounds. But there are other problems where belief propagation plausibly achieves uh, good, good computation bonds, right? And, and the dream here is that we, uh, um, you know, we could, the dream is would be to, to get some kind of unified theory for efficient optimization by, um, that, that is based on, uh, um, on a concrete polynomial time um, meta-algorithm, not of the kind uh, that we saw here, but one that is not based on local search. And, uh, and, and what we want of, about this meta-algorithm is that it applies in a canonical way, a canonical way to lots of different problems. And um, you know, it, made, it might give different guarantees for the kinds of problems. You know, it might be inherent. But what we want is that the guarantees that it achieves should be best possible among all polynomial time algorithms. Okay? So that's the, the dream. Okay? And uh, you know, so maybe only 15 years ago, this kind of uh, uh, you know, unified theory would have been pure fantasy. But there are some recent developments that, uh, you know, for the first time, give hope that such a unified, is not unified theory is not fantasy, but, uh, but uh, within reach. And one of these developments is the sum of squares uh, method, which I'm going to talk about today. And um, you know, w w one important thing is that you know, so this kind of a theory would, would bring a kind of conceptual clarity to the design of efficient algorithms that uh, you know, we, we sort of lost hope uh, uh, on. And, uh, and I think you know, it, it would be very, uh, it would be, you know, really great. It, these are great opportunities to, um, you know, to change how we think about uh, computing in general. Okay. So, uh, so this this candidate um, meta algorithm that could be uh, a basis for this kind of unified theory is called sum of squares. Um, it um, you know was introduced by uh, Shor uh, in, in some early form and then later refined by Parillo and Lasser. And um, you know it, it um, it's based on um, on, a, on an algorithmic technique called uh, convex relaxations, and I will um, sort of explain this uh, later on. And um, it has a property that it captures and generalizes the best um, you know very different kinds of algorithms, and um, in this way it achieves the the, um, the best known guarantees um, of efficient algorithms of polynomial time algorithms for a wide range of problems, you know including um, the two problems that we saw, uh, MinCut and uh, MaxCut. Okay, and um, so you know the question is: Is could this could this algorithm have the property that it achieves the best possible um, uh, guarantees among all polynomial time algorithms? And this is, in this sense, could could it be optimal? And there are uh, some ev some kind of evidences evidence that, that this algorithm might be uh, might, might be optimal. And one evidence is uh, uh, assuming the the, um, the unique games conjecture due to code. Um, and what uh, what 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 this Unigames conjecture predicts? So this is this Unigames conjecture is a, is a con very concrete conjecture about the computa computational hardness of a very particular problem, but it, it has nothing to do with um, uh, with sum of squares. And uh, but but if this conjecture is true, uh, it turns out that it predicts that uh, achieving approximation guarantees that are better than those achieved by sum of squares is NP hard. For, for, for a large class of uh, discrete optimization problems, in particular, um, you know, and this class includes max cut. Okay, so this would, uh, would, 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 would say that this uh, 0.878 number that I uh, showed you on, on the, uh, on previously, is, uh, it's NP hard to achieve a better uh, approximation. Oh, that number's got a significance. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a solution to some, it's a solution to some, I suppose. absolute limit of that method? Um, it, in, in some sense, we will, we will come to that. Um, um, uh, yeah, I mean, this number is, is a solution to some isoparametric um, problem. Okay, and uh, so, so, so there's some significance to it, definitely. Okay. Uh, the question is if it's, sort of the, if it's uh, significant in, in the polynomial time this sense. Conjecture is true, whatever right. And that number is. Yeah, and, and, and the that conjecture. Yes, and that, and that conjecture, of course, does, does not encode that number. I mean, like, it's not like. A, so this, in, in, there are no uh, quantitative bounds appearing in the conjecture. Okay. Um, so it's quite surprising that it has this application. Uh, another um, uh, evidence for the optimality of sum of squares is that, um, um, right, so, so maybe I should first say something else. So it turns out that um, this Unigames conjecture actually doesn't just 
predict that some of squares is optimal, it actually predicts something stronger. And, uh, and, uh, and the fact that it predicts something stronger is, um, you know, means that it, 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 it you know, that even if, if, it, if, it, if, even if the unique games conjecture turns out to be false, it could still be the case that sum of squares achieves optimal uh, guarantees. And, and sort of one way to sort of dis disentangle these, di 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 uh, you know, uh, um, disentangle these kind of issues is uh, that, we, that we proved in a recent work with Lee and Raghavendra, uh, the first unconditional uh, lower bound um, as an evidence for uh, the optimality of sum of squares. And what we show is that uh, for a wide range of problems, the approximation guarantees that sum of squares achieves are optimal with respect to uh, some restricted but powerful model of computation that captures uh, convex programming relaxations. Okay, so these are two you know, uncomparable um, results but both pointing towards um, that uh, you know sum of squares might be an optimal uh, algorithm. Okay. So now the uh, plan for the rest of the talk is that I first introduce uh, the sum of squares algorithm, and illustrate in what what sense sum of squares captures the best known polynomial time uh, algorithms for many discrete optimization problems like min cut and max cut. And uh, in particular, we will see that two key ideas that underlie the sum of squares algorithm, and these are ideas are constructive variants of uh, two you know, very uh, important universal concepts, and that's the concept of proof, mathematical proof, and the concept of uh, probability. Okay. So we'll see constructive variants of that will play a role for sum of squares. Uh, and then we will see um, how to use these ideas in order to get um, improved uh, uh, algorithms, improved algorithmic guarantees using sum of squares um, for, for two um, for two optimization problems, and those are actually not discrete optimization problems. They are continuous uh, polynomial optimization problem. Uh, one is sparse coding, uh, a basic problem in machine learning. And uh, the second example is um, um, uh, it comes from quantum information theory and uh, it has to do with quantifying the amount of entanglement that you have in a, in a quantum system. OK, so let's uh, talk about some of squares. So um, and to put this, the sum of squares algorithm into context, let me tell you about the two cultures of uh, high dimension optimization. Okay? So you know, the most widely known and popular approach uh, for optimization you know, goes back to Newton and the invention of calculus. And um, you know, this approach searches through all local optima of, of a function in order to find uh, a global optimum. Okay? And local optima you know, have the nice property that you know, they are characterized sort of by, you know, derivatives and, uh, and so on. <laughs> and uh, this approach is also the basis for these local search-based heuristics that I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, like belief propagation would also be uh, an example of that. Uh, you know, unfortunately, this uh, approach runs into trouble um, if the number of local optima is, is exponential in the number of variables. And this can happen even for very simple uh, non-convex functions. And uh, so the, the simplest example I know is that we take this function f, univariate function, and uh, we apply it to different variables x1 up to xn. Okay. So then, um, so here this guy has local maxima at minus one and one. Then it means that this guy has a local um, maximum for any plus one minus one assignment to the variables, but only the all ones assignment gives you a global opt uh, optimum. Okay, and to sort of overcome this barrier of exponentially many bad uh, local optima, we will turn to a fundamentally different approach that goes back to, um, to Hilbert and uh, sort of the start of uh, algebraic geometry. Um, and uh, this approach is to, uh, to decompose the function into simple pieces in a way uh, that the optimum value becomes apparent. Okay. Um, so, so, so in particular, in this example, in this example decomposition, you know, um, this white part is uh, always non-negative, or it's always uh, non-positive if you include these minus signs. Uh, numbers are real. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. So I should. Uh, yeah. In that in that audience, I should say that. Uh, but you know, I, I do optimization, right? So there are inequalities involved. So I wanted. I wanted that these numbers. You know, yeah, there's some order on these numbers. Yeah. Um, but they will be real. Yeah. And um, so here, uh, you know, in this decomposition, this is uh, this is a square, and over the reals, uh, this is minus a, a sum of squares. So over the reals, this is always non-negative, non-positive. And it means that, and actually, it will be zero exactly if uh, x is equal to um, uh, one. 
uh, right? I mean, so, so this guy is only uh, uh, x is equal to one, and so so this decomposition uh, it, it tells you that uh, the optimum value of f, the maximum value of f is three halves, okay? and uh, it avoids this um, you know this curse of local optima by by giving you this global decomposition of the function, okay, and um, you know. Um, uh, and what's, um, what's uh, remarkable about uh, this approach is that it can be made efficient almost in full generality. And that is what this uh, sum of squares algorithm achieves. So it has a property that whenever there exists a decomposition of small size for a certain notion of size, um, this algorithm can find the decomposition efficiently. <coughs> and in, in particular, um, uh, the sum of squares algorithm is able to find the correct decomposition for this example that had an exponential number of bad uh, local um, Local maxima, and you know, the the, the, you know, you, you can see what, what's a good decomposition for this. It just sort of uses this decomposition and apply it for all of the variables. Okay, and what's uh, even more remarkable is that um, you know this continues to work if instead of using different variables here. So there must be some theorem here about the degrees of every yeah. number of variables and when you can and what you cannot do. Yes, yes. So, so if I have a quintic equation, right, and I want to find out the minimum, or I, I had to have higher. Higher order, sixth order, right? And I want to find the minimum. Then is this good? So uh, um, it, 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 it is. It is probably good in the sense that if this if this doesn't work, nothing else works. Oh. Um, <laughs> you know, because so, so the thing is that um, it's it's. I mean, um, here I say you know, if if there exists a small decomposition, then the algorithm can find yeah. it. Okay. But, what you have to but you, you, uh, I'm not saying anything about if there always exists a small decomposition. I mean, because yeah. like if you start using Hilbert's theorem or something. Yeah. Of course. Yes. 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 Exactly. So, so that's the, that will be the challenge to show that um, you know whenever you have an easy problem, there, there sh or whenever you have a, a problem you that. You have a function which is non-negative on the line, and you want to write it as sum of squares under some condition. Yes. Yeah, so, so the univariate case is obvious. I assume the existential theorem is general. Yes. Yes. The existential theorem doesn't give you any any interesting bounds. I mean, it can't give you bounds, right? Because it's generic, and we know that you know generically you can't solve. In these kinds of problems. So what we hope here is that whenever the problem has, you know, admits a polynomial time algorithm, the sum of squares, uh, you know, th these kind of decompositions exist, and then sum of squares can find uh, can find the decompositions. And the Scott conjecture says that. Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and actually, it, the Scott conjecture says, you know, it actually predicts um, much, much uh, sort of very specialized um, decompositions are optimal, and sum of squares can actually deal with a larger class of decomposition, and that's. Sort of a uh, source of tension between uh, actually between the Zinnigan's conjecture and the sum of squares uh, approach, because uh, it means that you know if the more general kind of decompositions that sum of squares can capture are give you more power, then it would refute the Zinnigan's conjecture. Uh, that's a very good question. So I think uh, I mean you know, there, there's a good number of people that believes it, and a good number of people that doesn't believe. Yeah. Um, uh, good. Okay. And um, right. So in, in these kind of decompositions, you know, uh, they capture you know the strongest uh, um, provable guarantees for lots of different problems um, that we know so far. And then you know, in this way, it achieves this kind of unification that I wanted in the beginning. That you know, we don't have to rethink the algorithm every time we change a problem. We just have to use this algorithm. Okay. And um, uh, so let me um, give you a different perspective on, on, on Hilbert's approach in, um, that, that, that will be useful for, in terms of un for understanding its capabilities. And Hilbert's approach you know, can be viewed as um, a sound and complete proof system for systems of polynomial inequalities. Um, ah. Oh. OK, so I, I hope that it's only. Uh, <laughs> Let's see. Ah, maybe maybe I can uh, fix this. <laughs> ah, okay. Okay. So now I can't read my slides. Okay. Um, right. So, so, so we can view it as a sound and complete proof system uh, for polynomial inequalities. And. Um, um, <coughs> and this proof system has a property that uh, whenever there exists um, um, 
a constant degree sum of squares proof, so degree here corresponds to the degree that appears in these decompositions, then we can find it in polynomial time. And um, uh, you know, and what makes this extremely um, powerful is that uh, it turns out that many real-world uh, mathematical proofs uh, turn out to be captured um, by constant degree sum of squares proofs. And uh, you know, one useful but very simple example is Cauchy-Schwarz. But they're also you know, rather deep isoparametric inequalities that are captured by constant degree sum of squares proofs. And here, you know, constant degree, um, so we think of the number of variables as huge. That's our input size. And, 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 and so we want the degree does not depend on the number of variables. It, it, it can depend on the, you know, the, the, sort of the kind of problem that we are trying to solve, but not on the in input size. Okay, that's what we want. And then, then it would correspond to a polynomial time algorithm for our problem. Sorry, polynomial in what? Polynomial uh, in, in the number of variables here. Yeah. So, so, we have the, we have polyno so we have polynomials in certain number of variables, and we want that the running time uh, should be polynomial in those number of variables. Okay, so the uh, use of polynomial will be a little bit. Um. Okay. Right. Oh, yeah. So, so I'm, I'm sweeping under the rug uh, issues uh, uh, of coefficients. So I wanted the coefficients have polynomial bit complexity. So, um, so if you know, if, if you have n variables, then the number of bits in the coefficients should be uh, polynomial in n. And then, uh, so, 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 and, and then I don't have to. Mm, yes. Yes. R rational. Yeah. Think of rational as a, as a good example. Yeah. You know, like, and we also, you know, we, we tend to uh, allow approximations, and then um, sort of these bit complexity issues are, are often not a, not a concern. Okay. Um. Can I ask you a silly question? Sure. So yeah, right. That's a good question. So, so sum of squares capture certain kinds of linear programs, and um, and actually this um, this unconditional lower bound that I mentioned in the beginning, um, it implies that um, um, for these kinds of problems, no polynomial size linear program will be better than sum of squares. So in that sense, it captures all uh, linear programs. And there's a, a generalization of linear programs called semi-definite programs. And, um, and sum of squares also has the property of capturing all, uh, uh, all, all semi different programs in the same way it captures all linear programs for a certain class of problems. So notice that, like all these statements, we sort of have to restrict um, you know, the kinds of the class of problems that we um, talk about in some way. Right? If, if I sort of start talking about graph isomorphism or something like that, then you know, it would be very unlikely that these kinds of things will be good. Or you know number theoretic problems, or, uh, problems with strong algebraic structure. So these are problems that, that don't really have algebraic structure, and where where it's uh, you know more uh, sort of analytical um, problems. Okay, so I want to illustrate um, how some squares um, captures the best known algorithms for discrete optimization problems like max, Minkat and Maxcut, and um, and. And it turns out that both of these um, uh, problems can be phrased in terms of uh, maximizing polynomials or optimizing polynomials over the hypercube and low degree polynomials over the hypercube. Okay, so um, let me define uh, for graph G, an uh, n vertex graph G, the cut function um, to be the function on the Boolean hypercube, n dimensional Boolean hypercube, um, with a, uh, that um, you know, for every um, point x on the hypercube outputs the number of edges that go between. Um, vertices where xi is equal to 0 and vertices where xi is equal to 1. Okay? So, so this uh, so fg of x outputs the number of edges that go between vertices with xi equals 1, uh, with xi equals 0 and uh, uh, xj equals 1. Okay, so, and this, uh, you know, this function is, is, is a degree 2 polynomial, and here is uh, sort of the one, one, uh, one uh, representation is a degree two polynomial, and um, you know using this uh, this function we can we can you know easily uh, uh, talk about um, Maxcut and Minkat. So uh, you know for example Maxcut would just correspond you know for a given graph we want to find uh, the maximizer of this cut function, and Minkat. Um, you know, remember for Minkat we have these two special vertices S and T that we want to separate, and then um, what we do is we we take the cut function and we substitute um, for x s zero and for x t one 
And now we get a new polynomial, new degree two polynomial, and now we want to minimize that, uh, that degree two polynomial. Okay, so that captures min cut. Okay, so, so now you see that, uh, you know, this problem of optimizing uh, even degree two polynomials over the hypercube captures, you know, interesting discrete optimization problems. And there are many other examples. And um, what we'll do is we'll use this these notion of sum of squares proofs in order to bound the optimal value of these kinds of optimization problems. Okay. And um, so, so let me define this notion of sum of squares proofs over the hypercube. So um, if you have two functions f and g over the hypercube, um, then we say that the inequality that f Yes. So in the worst case, right now they don't look like it. <laughs> You're going to give an algorithm which approximates both of them. Is that right. the point that doesn't solve? Right. So, so it, will, it will exactly solve this problem, and it will achieve a 0.878 right. approximation. Well, yeah, you will explain it. Right. I mean, uh, the second one exactly. I will explain the mathematical, I, I will explain sort of the math mathematical fact that underlies this. Um, so why it solves that exactly. Yes. Right. So, so. How do you relate uh, inequality on this upper cube and on the rule of Rn? Because this yeah. theory of sum of squares. Ah. Was ah. Okay. So, so before I talked about Rn, and now I talk about the hypercube. Is that the question? Yes. Um, so it turns out that. Yeah. It, it's it's not a um, a big problem. So. Um, it's actually like the sum of squares uh, in, into the full generality. It allows you to talk about arbitrary systems of polynomial inequalities. And so, so I can have, uh, so what you can do is you can have, in, uh, you know, part of the system of polynomial inequalities, you can have the, um, uh, the equations that define, uh, that define uh, the hypercube, which would be, uh, so in this case, xi squared minus xi is equal to zero. And uh, those are a nice basis for, um, for the hypercube. So, so there's some sort of this algebraic way of looking at it. Um, on the next slide, I will do it in a way that uh, sort of avoids uh, talking about the algebra. You will see. Uh, so if you have now an inequality between, fu between functions on the, on, the, on the hypercube, so you have two functions f and g on the hypercube, we say that the, the, the inequality f is at most g has a degree l sum of squares proof. And we will denote it in this way. If um, the function g minus f, so this will be a new function on the hypercube, uh, has a, a can be decomposed as a sum of squares of functions of degree at most uh, l over 2. And this identity should hold as functions over the hypercube. So it means that you know, if you think of, if if you want to think of it instead about polynomials, it means that this uh, you know equation holds modulo the, the ideal of, of the hypercube. But yeah, we will not we will not think about the ideal. We'll just think about it as functions. And um, you know what the sum of squares algorithm can do is, given f and g, it can decide if there exists a degree l sum of squares proof for the inequality between f and g, and uh, and it can find uh, it, it can find this kind of decomposition, and the running time it needs is n to the order l. And notice that uh, um, enter the well, you need L, yeah we want l to be a constant. Okay. And notice that l here n to the order l is is, is roughly is roughly the number of coefficients, number of monomials that play a role here. Okay, or the dimension of the subspace of degree um, polynomials of degree uh, l or l over two. Okay, and now you know if you want to talk about max cut, we want to maximize this cut function. So if you want to prove, a, now we you know, think about proving an upper bound on the, on the, on the maximum cut value. So the best uh, upper bound that we could try to prove on, on the maximum cut value is, of course, that, um, you know, that the function is always at most its maximum. Okay? That's the best uh, upper bound we could try to prove. Um, and um, you know, we could try to ask, does this inequality, so notice that this is a function on the hypercube, and this here is a constant function on the hypercube. So the right-hand side would be a constant function. Of, of the hypercube, so, so we can ask, you know, is there what's is, is there a, um, a low degree sum of squares proof of this inequality? Okay, and this turns out not to be the case, and it better, you know, not be the case because if it would be the case, it would pre prove that, uh, you know, uh, NP is equal to co-NP, um, uh, and, and actually, in, you know, using this ca ca uh, case, in fact, it will also, also prove that P is equal to NP. Okay, but what turns out to have a small uh, low degree sum of squares proof is is a weaker inequality. In particular, we you know, weaken the left-hand side by multi multiplying it by 0.878. And now this inequality always has a degree 2 sum of squares proof. For every graph, um, you know, this, this is true. Right? So this inequality has, has a degree 2 sum of squares proof. OK? 
Okay? And this is uh, at the heart of, uh, of this approximation algorithm that I mentioned. In particular, it implies, so, th so just knowing these two facts implies that you can approximate the, the value of the maximum cut up to 0.878 factor. And what you do is you just, um, you know, for all possible right-hand sides of this inequality, you, you run this algorithm and check if, uh, if it finds a proof or not, a degree two proof or not. And now, you know, you, and now you take this, the, the smallest number for which it, it finds a proof. And, and you know, you know, due to this, uh, that this number will be within a 0.878 factor. How this number got a meaning? Ah, um, uh, yes. It's obviously some yes. metric number. Exactly, exactly, right. If, if, if you optimize, over, yeah, just as you, you ask over all graphs, what, what is this, uh, what is sort of the, the best factor that you can put there? And now, now sort of it, it becomes clear that it's some isoparametric kind of, right. And this, this number, uh, if you, right, so maybe let's talk about that. So if you restrict yourself to degree two proofs, then 0.878 is the correct number. So there are graphs where, 0 .87, where you can't beat 0.878. You mean really that number? Yes. Uh, okay, so, so you know. <laughs> I'm just trying to understand what No, no, it, I mean, there, there are some, some there's, metric. yeah, yeah, no, there, there's some, there's some, uh, uh, you know, this really is. No, yeah, right, so this, this, this is shortened for, for some n number that involves some uh, arc tangents or whatever. So, 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 ah, I, I see. Yeah, that, that's, that is true. Uh, <laughs> right. I mean, I, do I know what the number is? Yeah, I'm not. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, you know, it's, yeah. I don't. I, I don't know it by heart. Yeah. What's you know what the what the, what the true form, what the correct formula is. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, right. And if if you want degree two, then this is the right number whatever I, the number I didn't write, write here. Um, so we know the worst, the worst graphs for degree two. And now if I ask, um, you know, what about degree four? So this would still be polynomial time using this fact. Uh, and then we don't know uh, graphs that um, have the same bound. And if you, if, if, if you show that actually a better bound is true, let's say 0.879 would be true if you look at degree um, four proofs, you would disprove the new games conjecture. And now you can ask, okay, uh, maybe it just it's always true that, you, that it doesn't help if you allow larger degree. So, uh, so that, that will not be the case. Um, if you look at uh, the min cut problem, again, you know, yeah, we have, uh, you know, here we want to minimize this function. And the best lower bound that we can hope is, is to prove is, 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 is the true lower bound on the function. And in fact, this has a, has a small sum of squares proof. Not surprising because this has a polynomial time algorithm. But it turns out that you, if you really want to prove this, you need degree four, not degree two, even though um, these functions are degree, you know, quadratic polynomials. So, so just, so if you have quadratic polynomials, you know, clearly you need, the, the proof degree has to be at least two, but actually you need degree four uh, if you want to get the right bound for min cut. So in that sense, this min cut algorithm is even more sophisticated than uh, the maximum. Uh, but it's not, it's, it's not really a good way to think about it. Okay. And now you can ask, um, you know, let's, let's try it a bit more ambitious. It's also easy to, to see that if you sort of make, it's generically true if you make the degree large enough and, um, you know, degree two times n will be, will, be, will be enough, then you can always, you know, you can, all, you can prove all inequalities that are true over the hypercube, okay? And the reason um, for this is, um, you know, that if you... Um, Ah, 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 right, it, 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 it wasn't, so, right, it wasn't using, so this is, um, right, so, so Fort Falkes is a combinatorial algorithm. It, it, it the ah, 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 you mean in terms of running time? Uh, no, 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 it, I think that, that would be, the running time would be n squared, right? So, so the kinds of running times that you get from this, you know, I mean, this, this I'm also hiding some order here, right? Ah. So, uh, so, so the running times will be just polynomial, uh, but, but that's the best you can say. So even, even this, you know, I, I said that you can do it in linear time, but, but not, not, not sort of in a black box way. Of course, I mean, actually the linear time algorithm will, will use sort of still the same kind of mathematical setup, but you, you now have just have to think more deeply about what you really need in order to get this number. And why is the minimum, how come you can hit the minimum on the nodes because it's degree four? Ah, um, yeah, I mean, there, there, there are. You, you, you said you wondered, you marveled at the difference. Right, right. No, no, no. So, 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 so this is, this is, this is, you know, okay. So here, what I wanted is I wanted this meta algorithm that captures 
different, you know, different versions of the problem. Of course, like this is not, you know, from a like this is not uh, sort of the most satisfying explanation um, for, for for why you can do this exactly and why you can uh, can do this only approximately. So it's, ah, a more satisfying explanation. Um, Right. Uh, I mean, you know, it. it um, no, no, I mean, it, it, it uses, I mean, so this, the fact that there exists um, uh, yeah. this degree four proof uses the fact that, you know, this is a combinatorial problem. And, and there are certain combinatorial facts that I know about combinatorial problems. Um, for example, so this uses uh, the fact that if you have if the minimum cut value is k, uh, the reason for that is always that there are k arc disjoint paths from S to T. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, you can sort of it makes sense if you if you see it in a, a, a examples, and th that is used in proving that these proofs exist. Okay, but uh, but the the, the 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 point is that if I just wanted to um, if I just wanted to 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 know this number, I don't need to know sort of what goes into this what goes into this proof because I can use this as a black box. Of course, then I, from, a, from a mathematical point of view, we, we would like, you know, it would be great to have better sort of uh, understanding of what these things do. But so this just sort of uh, clarifies what are the algorithmic techniques that you need to look at. Right. OK. Um, now let me uh, talk briefly about um, this uh, question of um, how to find some squares proof. So before I just asserted that you can do it in point number time. And, um, <coughs> The details are a little bit technical, but there's. Um, um, but I want to show you the, the mathematical fact that underlies the algorithm. And the mathematical fact is the following: so it turns out that if you have a um, function on the hypercube and it has a degree l, um, then, then it has a degree l proof, let's say, of this inequality, if and only if there exists um, a positive semi-infinite matrix M, such that um, the function f is uh, the quadratic form of M evaluated at this vector, um, wh where this vector contains all monomials up to degree at most l over 2. Okay, so, so this is, okay, uh, maybe I shouldn't have used, used this notation. So this is just a vector that contains all degree, all, put all monomials of degree up to l over 2. And now we have this, we have this uh, vector that contains polynomials now. And now we plug it into the quadratic form of this positive semi matrix M. Now we get a new polynomial. And we want that this polynomial is the same uh, function on the hypercube as f. Okay, and it's uh, you know you can see that this should be true. You know, let's say, let me just show you one one step of the proof idea. You know, this quadratic form. You know, by taking square roots because you have a PSD matrix, you can see that this is um, you know this 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 square of a Euclidean norm. And now you know every, so every coordinate of this vector will be a polynomial of degree l over two. So now uh, so that means that this uh, squared norm is is a sum of squares of polynomials of degree l, at most l over two. And actually, it's not hard to see that every sum of squares of polynomials of degree at most L over 2 can, re can be represented. So, so what's, what's the size of this matrix? Just to be sure I understand. Ah, so this matrix has, OK, in this picture, it has uh, dimension n plus 1 raised to the L over 2. So that's yeah, the. n plus 1 raised to the L over 2. Yes. So it's a big matrix if L is big. Right. L, L equals 2 is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So, so this is not. I mean, yeah. So, so I mean, one one thing that you see also is this is not a pra these the kind of algorithms that you get from this are not practical algorithms. But uh, you know, one one thing that we believe in complexity theory is that once you have a polynomial time algorithm, that you know it tells you something um, about the problem that allows you to get practical algorithms. And um, and I think this um, is uh, there, there, there's ample support uh, for for this statement uh, in literature. Okay. So, 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 so in complexity theory, we like this uh, to, to disentangle this issue of practicality and uh, polynomial running time. Okay, um, right. And so, so this fact means that, okay. And this, this really, this fact really is at the heart why you can, uh, you know, for, why you can find some of squares proofs efficiently if they exist. And the reason is that, um, you know, if you look at the set of matrices that satisfy this condition, that satisfy this equation, it will be an affine linear subspace of matrices. Uh, of matrices, and so that means that what we what we want to do to, to, to check whether this, this proof exists is that we have this. Um, yes, yes, that, that is a semi-different program. Oops. Okay, it's not a good. One. So you know what we what we do is of uh, pictorially is that we have some affine subspace, 
something like that. Now we ask, does it contain a PSD matrix or not? So it means that we intersect it with the cone of PSD matrices. Very abstractly, it looks like that. And uh, so these kinds of questions, you know, um, does the subspace contain a PSD matrix is exactly what, what can be solved with semi different programming. Okay. So now we saw um, examples, um, you know, how, how to use uh, some of squares in order to um, capture the best known algorithms for um, discrete optimization problems like min cutting, max cut. And, um, and now we, I want to talk about how to use it for uh, continuous uh, optimization problems. And here, um, it will turn out, so, so, be, so before, we just were able to recover sort of previous algorithms. And here, it turns, and, and for, for this in the continuous setting, it turns out that we will be able to um, prove new bounds that are vastly better than what we could do with other methods. Okay. Um, right, so, so suppose we have a homogeneous uh, polynomial, um, uh, and we think of it as a function on the unit sphere, and we want to maximize it. Okay. So if f is a quadratic polynomial, then uh, the maximum value is just, uh, just the top eigenvalue of its uh, coefficient matrix, and we can do it in polynomial time, this maximization. Um, however, if, if f uh, is a degree 4 polynomial, then in general, uh, this problem is N it becomes NP-hard, and even uh, it becomes also hard to approximate. Um, so and so now, the, now the key question that we want to, uh, want to think about is, you know, for discrete optimization problems, we, 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 we were somehow able to say, you know, yes, we, 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 we just want to optimize some quadratic function over the hypercube, but now I have, you know, these families of particular uh, uh, quadratic polynomials. Ah, no, no, so, so, so I think of the sphere as a se in the same kind of se sense as, as I had the hypercube before. So I had some, some simple variety that before it was the hypercube, and now it's a sphere. So bo both, are, both are defined by quadratic equations. Uh, you know, okay, the sphere is just one quadratic equation, the uh, hypercube has several quadratic equations. Um, and, and so now we want to, and we want to optimize some, f some low degree polynomial over, over that variety. So, 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 so those, those are, um, that's, a con or that's a relationship between the two problems. Ah, I mean, the, the equations that you define are quadratic. Uh, you used to define uh, the hypercube are quadratic, right? Xi squared is equal to Xi. That's the, because, you know, in every coordinate. Yeah. You, I mean, the difference is, yeah. I mean, actually, like, uh, yeah, for, for us, the sphere and the hypercube are very close together. <laughs> and, okay, so, yeah, so maybe I, um, but in particular, so, so before we defined this notion of uh, what's, a, what's a sum of squares proof of an inequality between functions on the hypercube. So we can use the same kind of definition to define a, sum, a notion of sum of squares proofs for functions over, over the sphere. And we say that, you know, you, you can prove, let's say, that f is not negative over the sphere, what, what do you do? Well, you, you try to, you know, you, you, you decompose f as a sum of squares of, 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 uh, of low degree functions, and this decomposition should be, should be valid over, you know, as functions over the, hyper, over the sphere. Okay? And, and algebraically, it just uh, makes a difference, you know, what, what's the ideal that you mod out? Do you mod out xi squared equals xi, or do you mod, mod out that the sum of the xi squared is equal to 1? Okay, but, but now, now the thing is that we want to do is we want to, you know, just like for this for discrete optimization where we distinguish different families of, of polynomials, like one was max cut, one was min cut, now we want to distinguish different families of, of uh, degree four polynomials, let's say, um, and uh, so, so that, you know, and try to understand when can we have polynomial time algorithms and why not. Why did you want f to be a continuous? Say again? Why did you want f to be a continuous? Ah, um, yeah, actually I don't, uh, I don't think, so, so the examples that I have in mind will be really homogeneous. Uh, so somehow functions on the sphere, uh, I like them more if they're homogeneous. I'm not sure if there's a good reason for that. Um, yeah. Okay. So an example I want to talk about is uh, called sparse coding. I think I'll just uh, give a brief impression of this. Um, and uh, so, so let me talk about, uh, this, this comes uh, from uh, machine learning. Let me talk about what's, what's the motivation for the problem. It's, it's, it's cute. So, uh, um, so in this problem, um, um, we, we, we think of having uh, um, some, um, some, some vectors, x1 up to xm. Uh, that's our data. 
and let, these are vect uh, vect let's say vectors in Rd. And um, one one thing to one case to think about is that these vectors encode patches of natural images. Okay, so maybe like the, you know the pixels, uh, pixel intensities of natural of patches of natural images. And now we want to um, transform, you know, given this, these, these vectors, what we want to do is we want to find uh, a matrix A, and let's say it's, a, a, it's an invertible matrix, uh, such that, um, um, you know, so, so sort of, uh, with linearly independent uh, columns, uh, such that um, our input vectors x have sparse linear representations in this, uh, um, you know, with respect to this matrix A. So what this means is that um, you know if you have these um, so if, if if you can do this what this means is that um, any um, patch of a natural image um, is a sparsely new ah, okay sorry so uh, I should have said what 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 this right hand side is so if if you do if you if you you know there are some kind of heuristic algorithms that try to do this if you do this on on patches of natural images the kind of uh, the columns of the matrix A that you will get they will correspond to the kinds of patterns that you can see on the right. Okay, so these these kinds of small patterns are the you know will be the uh, will, will will form the columns of this matrix A, and then what what it says is that um, nat you know, patches of natural images can be well approximated as sparse linear combinations of these kinds of patterns. Okay, and now the algorithmic question is you know given um, some some set of um, images can we find uh, this kind of basis where they have a sparse representation? Okay. And they, uh, you know, said less. Lots of applications in image processing. It's uh, some connection to deep learning. And uh, originally, it was uh, you know, proposed as a model for the visual cortex. So that's sort of uh, you know, um, the idea is that that's sort of how, how, uh, what happens if we if we process uh, Im you know images in our brain. Okay. Any uh, so, so, so so I didn't define the problem yet. But any just high level questions about this? So I will I will define the problem more uh, more clearly in a second on the next slide. Okay. And uh, so, so so what we want to do is now is we want uh, provable algorithms for this kind of problem. And um, and what we want is that the algorithms work. You know they sh they should work in a wide range of um, of possible inputs. In particular, you know we don't want to make too strong assumptions about the kinds of uh, Matrices A, so those are called dictionaries uh, that we have here. And um, what another thing that we want is that we want um, so if if, this, if you have if you imagine that we have um, you know that these images come from some distribution, and there is some you know ground truth for the for the sparse representations. We want to allow um, you know correlations between um, the coordinates in these sparse representations, and uh, and we also want to you know that the algorithm works even if these representations are not extremely sparse, and there's sort of some barrier of root n that um, you know that uh, that, uh, that that is important to beat. And um, you know, if if you don't use sum of squares, um, and all previous uh, provable methods for this problem, they're limited to achieving at most two of these goals. And with sum of squares, you can achieve all three of those goals. And um, so let me sort of tell you what's the connection to um, polynomial optimization. So, um, so here is the setup a little bit uh, cleaned up. So we have some unknown orthogonal matrix A, and the columns are A1 up to N. And we have an unknown distribution D over sparse vectors Y. Okay? So, that's, uh, so, 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 so these things exist in nature. We don't know, uh, we, but we don't know them. And now what we, what we, what we get as our input are uh, independent samples of the form X equals to A times Y. Okay? So, so, so we, we get these sparse linear, uh, sparse linear combinations of the columns of A, and we get uh, many of many examples of that. So those those would be the images that we see in the real world, and uh, but we don't know these these patterns uh, uh, corresponding to the matrix A. And now what we want to do, given these samples, we want to recover the vectors A1 up to AN. Okay, so this is a mathematical model, mathematical model for the problem that I talked about before. And now it turns out that under um, you know relatively mild assumptions on this distribution D. Um, and uh, you know, and also on the number of samples, so we need a certain number of samples for this for this to make sense for, for you know for, for us to be uh, to hope that we can recover the vectors. It turns out that there's a simple degree four polynomial that you can define in terms of the um, the images that you got. Okay, and we'll just be uh, uh, this guy. So this is related to the fourth moment of the distribution of images that you see. And this degree four polynomial has the property 
that over the sphere, it, it is within epsilon of this, of this polynomial. Okay, and this polynomial, a nice thing about this polynomial is that here, you know, you really see the AIs. And if so there's some reason that the second moments aren't enough? Yes, the second moments will, um, the, issue, the, issue will, the second moments will be essentially constant over the sphere. So, and, and, and right, and maybe let me show you the picture here. So if you think about this as a, as a function on the sphere, ah, it's cut off. So what, how it looks like is that um, there are these separated spikes corresponding to a1 up to an, where, where this polynomial is large, and all, everywhere else the polynomial is small. Right? So, so if you look at this polynomial over the sphere, the place where it's maximized is exactly uh, on the AIs. And, uh, and then we have this fudge term epsilon here that comes because we, you know, we don't know this distribution d. And uh, so, so it means that um, so there's some kind of local behavior that we don't understand. But the global behavior is governed by the vectors a1 up to an. And so we want to, and we want to recover uh, those vectors. Okay, so in that sense, a1 up to an are the unique global maximizers approximately of this polynomial. And we want to understand uh, if, we can find the, if we can find this out, if, if we can recover the vectors using that information. Okay? And um, you know, it turns out that some of squares can do this in polynomial time. And the reason for that um, is, um, uh, is again using these kinds of, in terms of these proofs, because it turns out that, you know, I mean, what I wrote here is really an inequality between this function and this function. And, uh, and, and this inequality, and it turns out not to, not to be only true. And it's, it's not just true, this inequality, but it also has a low degree sum of squares proof. Okay, and this, this means that, uh, that sum of squares, what, what, what sum of squares can basically do for you is given this function, given this polynomial, it can, it can, it can sort of, uh, you know, remove uh, the, the, um, some kind of uh, noise and return to you this polynomial. And, 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 um, and, that's sort of, and there's a classical result um, due to Jenrich um, in the context, context of tensor decomposition that, that shows that if, if, if I would give you this polynomial exactly, then uh, you can recover the vectors a1 up to an. Okay. I think uh, uh, I'll uh, stop at this point. Great. Well, thank, you thank you very much. Very